Let me start with a couple of uh, thank yous. A huge thank you to Ilford for supporting this work. You know, the work that I do often goes unsupported because brands don't want to be associated with this kind of uh, stories. A lot of people, they back away from supporting projects that have such a humanitarian type photography. So Ilford has been uh, magnificent in supporting um, the work that I'm doing, and without them, this exhibition wouldn't have been possible. Um, it was funny, somebody was talking to me about film the other day, um, and they were saying, why are you a retro photographer? Why do you shoot on film that way? And it's kind of made me laugh that, you know, I've been shooting on film for so long, I've become retro. Um, it's a simple fact, I never made a choice to go back to film, I just never left it. Um, I have the same camera, uh, old Canon, that I've shot on for 25 years. It's been to more wars than anybody, um, it's still going strong, and people always look at it and they say, why are you still using that camera? Because it still works. So, <laughs> I'm a very simple man, um, I stick with what works, and for me, it has always been the Ilford HP5, one film camera, and that's been my career for 25 years. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk about stories. I'm a photographer, but really my work is all about stories. It's just that the camera is my tool. And I'm going to be telling you my own story. Um, I am going to ramble on for quite a while. So if any of you get bored and need a snooze, I totally understand. I've got a lot I want to talk about tonight. Because it's really nice to get the opportunity to really talk about photography. Um, often I'm talking about the issues, but tonight I want to talk a bit more about the process as well and why I work in the way I do as a photographer. But let's start really at the beginning of my photographic career. I was 18 years old. I'd gone to the States on a sports scholarship. I was the world's worst boxer. But I thought I was great. Um, sport was my life. I remember my coach saying to me, Giles, you take a punch really well. At 18, you still think that's a compliment. Um, but sport was everything for me. And I was in the States and had a minor car accident. But it was enough that my knees were damaged and I was told I would never do sport again. I came back to London. I was in hospital here. And I was an incredibly angry young man. I was very frustrated that everything I'd worked towards, all this sport, had been taken away from me. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And that's when something, a small gift really, a, a very small gesture, was to change my life forever. My godfather passed away. And he left me his Olympus OM-10 camera and a book by the war photographer Don McCullen. Now, I grew up in a house, my parents weren't that interested in art or the news or media, and I had never seen photographs like Don McCullen's, these black and white images from the wars in Biafra, Bangladesh, Vietnam. And I looked through these photographs, and they had such an impact on me. To this day, if I shut my eyes, I can still remember those first images I saw of Don's. And lying in that hospital bed, I knew this is what I was going to do with my life. I had finally found it. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So I actually taught myself photography lying in a hospital bed. I would photograph all the doctors and nurses, my friends. I was 18 years old, so mainly I photographed the nurses. But I taught myself the basics of photography there, and I left full of good intentions to follow in the footsteps of Don McCullen. But I got a bit sidetracked. Um, I had some friends that were in bands. Um, they asked me if I'd come along and photograph their gigs. Um, and I kind of enjoyed doing that. And before I knew it, magazines were ringing me up and asking me to go and photograph bands. Um, and so, in the middle of the 90s, a great time for music in, in Britain, I found myself right in the middle of the music world. It was great. I worked with bands like Oasis and Blur, Prodigy, Underworld, um, Marilyn Manson, Lenny Kravitz, Mariah Carey. It was an amazing experience. I remember my uh, Auntie Margaret, She's a very stern Scottish woman. She's quite scary. And we sat there on Christmas Day, and she was looking through some of my photographs, and she said, Giles, I thought you wanted to be a serious photographer. She goes, what went wrong? She said, why are you doing this? And I said, I've got to be honest, Auntie Margaret. I am doing this for the beautiful women and great parties. And she said, seriously? And I said, I'm 20 years old. That's a legitimate reason for a career path. And at that stage, it really was, and I loved it. I had an amazing time. But as the years went on, I found myself increasingly unhappy. And I couldn't really figure it out. I seemed to have this amazing life. I worked for Vogue, GQ. I was, uh, let's say, hanging out with all these kind of movie stars, and models, and actors. But I would do a shoot, 
and I'd find myself going to my hotel room almost in tears because I didn't feel happy. And it made no sense to me. How could I have all of this and be unhappy? And as the years went on, that unhappiness grew. And by the time I was in my late 20s, I was really struggling. I also had a problem with the way that women were portrayed in a lot of the magazines I worked for. At that time, it was always a man in a suit and a woman in her underwear. And as a photographer, I grew really uncomfortable with that. And in the end, it came to a climax. I was doing a shoot in the Charlotte Street Hotel in Soho. Uh, there was an argument going on between a young actress, the editor of a magazine, um, and her agent about her state of undress in this shoot. And sitting there, I suddenly thought, this is not why I became a photographer. So the rock and roll story is that I took my cameras and I threw them all out the window of the Charlotte Street Hotel. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not without rock and roll. I'm more of a Radio 4 guy. So I had a little hissy fit. I threw them on the bed. It's just unfortunate they bounced out the bed and out the window. <laughs> and let me tell you, Mamir RZ turns out it makes a big crack in a pavement. Um, so that was really... I thought the end of my photographic career. I was only 28 years old. Um, I moved out of London. Um, I got a job in a bar um, and really sunk into a very, very deep depression. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Um, I wanted to tell you this story, uh, Ukraine, 2010. This is a kind of transformation story for me. It's when I really became more of a storyteller than just a photographer. I'd gone there to do uh, a story on street kids. Um, I'd heard a lot about uh, the way that they were living, that a lot of them had come from former parts of Russia to live in Ukraine. When they got there, they only found poverty. They couldn't get access to healthcare or education. Um, so they were living in abandoned buildings. So this was one group that I got to know. Um, some people would call them a gang. I called them a family. They were a kind of dysfunctional family, but they operated like this little family. At the front is uh, Sasha, who was the leader of the gang with his girlfriend. They lived in this abandoned building. You know, most of the time, it was just boredom. Um, it's one of the things, again, that I've realized I'm very interested in. Boredom. It sounds a strange thing to say, but people are always looking for the most dramatic images. Actually, most of life is stuck in the middle. Somebody recently described my photographs in a review that they said that he is the master of capturing boredom. And I took that as such a compliment, because that's often where the stories lie, especially with the work you'll see here of refugees. Most of their life is stuck in limbo. So many of the photographs I take are of little details, people brushing hair, holding hands, the little intimacies of daily life. I mean, of course, in this place, there was a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. A lot of them came from abusive homes that they often followed those patterns. But what I saw was often tenderness and the way that they looked after each other. This is when one of the young girls had cut herself and the others were tending to the wound, disinfecting it. Often, they were just there sweeping up I always say this is a photograph that really deeply disturbs me. It's funny because it's just a picture of a girl sweeping up. Another photographer might have shown the picture of them injecting drugs, but this upsets me more because this reminded me that this was just a young girl who wanted normal life and that every day they would try and turn their little squat into something that resembled a home. I'd been told these kids were worthless, that they had no interest in any of this, and that's what I saw. On the last day, they took me out. Um, to the Black Sea to have a sort of farewell celebration before I left. Um, we were there, uh, Sasha, the leader of the gang, he comes up to me, he puts his arm around my neck, and he goes, you, me, swim. I was like, oh, I'm not really feeling it, mate. He's like, you, me, swim. Now, whenever I go traveling, obviously I Google and check everything. Three things really struck me. One was to avoid the street kids. Um, the advice was also to watch out for crime. And thirdly, whatever you do, don't go swimming in the Black Sea because it's so heavily polluted. So I'm thinking all these things, and obviously that's me swimming in the Black Sea. Now, in the background, you can see some of the kids. They have my camera, my passport, my wallet. I'm thinking, well, I believe in trust, but this is the point when maybe they run off. I have to go down to a police station in my wet underwear. They'd be like, what happened? Well, I gave my stuff to some street kids who went swimming. What could go wrong? But of course, that is the wonderful thing about trust, is when you give it, you tend to get it back. So, in fact, what was happening is one of the young kids, Lilik, had my camera, and he was walking up and down the beach, and I watched him, and he stamped. And when he stamped, the seagulls would take off, and then he would take a photograph. And this boy was like 13, 14 years old, and I remember thinking, all the others were just taking funny pictures of each other, but he had an idea, he had a vision of something he wanted to create, 
was making that happen and then photographing it. I thought, that's a real photography. He had a real eye and a real talent. That evening, um, I went back to the squat with them. This is Lilik with his girlfriend, Rusella. And I said to Lilik, when I get back to London, I'm going to buy you a camera, I'm going to send it out here, and I want you to start photographing your own life. And he was so excited. I don't know if anybody had ever bought him anything or ever encouraged him to do anything. The next day, I said I'd pop back on my way to the airport, that I'd pop in and say goodbye. When I turned up the next morning, um, Lilik was dead. That night, Roussel had found him in the bed next to her. He was cold, um, probably maybe taking too many pills or vodka, the damp, the cold, a combination of all those things. But the police came, they took his body, and they dumped it in an unmarked grave outside the city. Because to most people, his life is worthless. To most people, his life meant nothing. But that's why I do what I do. Because to me, every story is important. Every story is as important as the stories in this room and the stories of my own family. Um, it was while doing this kind of work, I was in Afghanistan um, a year later, in 2011. I was documenting the impact of war on a group of American soldiers. Um, we were ambushed, and as we were moving away, I stepped on a landmine. I lost both my legs and my arm. I remember lying there. It was a beautiful day. Um, I was under a tree. I remember the birds singing. I remember the blue sky. This is a photograph taken in those moments. I thought they would be the last moments of my life. But miraculously, um, I was rescued. I was taken, and I survived. Um, I was flown back to hospital in Birmingham. I spent the next 46 days in intensive care. Um, at the end of that, I was moved to a high dependency unit. I spent pretty much a year in hospital, 37 operations. I was told I'd never walk again, I would never ever work again, and probably have to live with a carer for the rest of my life. But I want to tell you something really remarkable. Three days after I was injured is when I was flown back to the UK. My family was told I was going to die the next day or so. As they wheeled me in from the, um, from the airport into the hospital, I was unconscious, I was on all these drugs. But my sister said, he's trying to say something. And I said, no, he can't. He's out. He said, she said, you don't know my brother, he's trying to say something. So they took the Austrian mask off. My sister leant over. And my poor sister, I'm sure she was expecting me to say, I love you, or I'm sorry. But the only words that came out were, I am still a photographer. And I believe that is what kept me alive. From that moment, I always believed I would find a way to take photographs again. Three months after I was injured, I was well enough to have a shower for the first time. It was the first time they put me in a wheelchair. I was taken to have this shower, and I saw myself in a mirror for the first time. And I was so repulsed. I saw my missing limbs, the scars across my body, and I really was sickened by my own image. And I went to bed that night, and I remember crying myself to sleep and thinking, I wished I'd just died in Afghanistan. I remember thinking, I didn't want a life where I couldn't walk, a life where I couldn't work. Everything I valued had been taken away from me. But the next morning, I woke up, and something had clicked in my mind. And I made a decision there and then. I said, I will never think about what I can't do but I will focus on what I can, and I will excel at that. And I knew the first thing I needed to do was confront how I felt about myself. And what's the best way to do that? Photography. So my friend Simon, he came to the hospital, um, he literally broke me out of the hospital, and we went to his photographic studio. We might have gone via the pub, <laughs> but we got to his studio, and I wanted to do a self-portrait. As I say, I, I was repulsed by the way I looked, I remember if my friends came out, I would cover up my arm or cover up my, my legs. And I thought, there's only one way I can do this. And I kept thinking of Roman and Greek statues and how if you go to the museum, even though they're missing parts, you see the beauty that is there. And so I did this self-portrait. And this was the moment I said to the world, I do not care. I am what I am. Inside, I'm exactly the same person. In fact, maybe I'm a bit better, a bit stronger, a bit more focused. And this was the moment 
I took control of my own story. And this was the moment I truly was a photographer again. I went back to hospital. Um, as I say, I was there for a year, 37 operations. But by the end of that year, I was able to begin my rehabilitation. Um, they finally taught me how to walk again. They also taught me how to make strange grimacing faces. And eventually, I figured out ways to hold a camera and to take photographs again. I now want to tell you a story about my work and maybe proof that a photograph can change the world. Soon after I'd been injured, literally days after I'd been injured, um, the beginnings of the Syria war were happening in Dara, the first protests. I watched on the news as I went through my recovery over that year as the war in Syria grew more bloody and violent. And I remember thinking to myself, this was going to be the most important story of my career. And even when I was in my wheelchair, I was trying to figure out ways that I could tell it. In 2014, three years after I got injured, I was well enough to truly go back to work. And the first big story I wanted to do was on Syrian refugees living in Lebanon. Um, I wanted to document some of the most vulnerable refugees, the elderly, single mothers, and those living with injuries from war, like myself. People like Khaloud. Khaloud had been at home in Syria when a sniper shot her in the spine. She was paralyzed instantly from the neck down. Her family managed to get her out into Lebanon, but when I met her, she was living in a makeshift tent. She had no support apart from her husband, Jamal, who was an amazing man. But they lived literally in a place made of cardboard and corrugated metal. A woman paralyzed from the neck down. On that trip, um, I also met Reem. Reem lived on a rooftop. She had lost a leg and her husband had been killed when a rocket hit their house. Because of her prosthetic leg, she couldn't get in and out of this building. So she literally lived stuck on this rooftop. The only person that lived with her was her father, Abdel. Now, you'll see in all my portraits, I like to photograph people looking directly at the camera. But with Abdel on this rooftop, he kept looking out to the side. I finally said to him, why do you keep looking over there? And he said, you see the mountains in the distance? I said, yes. He said, that is Syria. He goes, I'm an old man. I will probably never return home. But at least by living on the rooftop, it's the first thing I see in the morning and the last thing I see at night. Now, on this trip, I also met a young girl called Aya. I've kind of spoken about it a little bit, but I don't like to photograph people as victims. Victims of circumstance, but I don't like to create sympathy. I like to create solidarity. But with Aya, I was really struggling. At the time, she was four years old. She had spina bifida, meaning she was paralyzed from the waist down. She was living in this tent that was wet, muddy, and dark. And I thought, if I take her photograph, she's just going to look like a victim. So I said, I'm not going to take a photograph. I'd rather just visit for the day. And that's what I did. Well, not for the first time in my life. It turned out I was completely and utterly wrong. Aya is the feistiest four-year-old I've met in my life. She didn't just run her family. She ran this whole refugee camp. Her sister came in, and she was, hey, donkey, pick me up. So she picked up, and she'd walk around the camp, and she'd point to somebody, hey, donkey, do this, and donkey, give me that. And everybody did what Aya said. So eventually, I was able to take a photograph that summed up the true spirit. And earlier on, I was saying about how I photographed those women in Angola. And I tried to create an image of, of kind of a classic documentary photographer, and I didn't photograph them laughing. And that's how I developed. So now when I photograph somebody like Aya, it's like this. And this is her playing hopscotch with her sister. Like I say, you don't always have to show people as victims, victims of circumstance. But what I see again and again is resilience, is strength, is often humor and laughter. And I see love. And those are the things that I photograph. Um, in 2015, a year after that, I was commissioned by the UNHCR to document the refugee crisis around the Middle East. Those are the images that you see around you today. Scenes uh, that many of us will be familiar with, from Lesvos, uh, the boats landing. Um, it was a huge project. It took me a year. Um, why did I do it? Because for me, it was the most important story happening at the time, and I didn't necessarily agree with the way it was being told. 
is there such a thing as truth in photography? Again and again, I hear people talking about the truth of photography. I see competitions that set rules because they say, if this is manipulated or not manipulated, if it's not manipulated, this is the truth. Well, I say there is no such thing as truth in photography. As soon as I walk in a room and I point my camera in that direction, I've already ruled out everything behind me. As soon as I choose that fraction of a second in a day, I have ruled out all the other seconds in that day. So what is truth? But I do believe in honesty, and I believe there can be honesty in photography. And a little example, this is in Edemeni. This is the border crossing between Macedonia and Greece. Uh, there were about 2,000 refugees who just arrived there when the Macedonians shut the border. There were 2,000 people, many of them with children, many of them still wet from the beaches of Lesbos and terrified, and they didn't know what was going on. Within that 2,000, there were less than 100 people, young men, who became angry, and they started to push the fence. Some of them started to throw bricks. And I knew what would happen, and it did. The world's press descended on Edemeni, and you could see all the media surrounding this group of 100. And the next day, across the world, were pictures of people throwing bricks or pushing a fence. Now, that is a truth. That did happen but that was 100 out of a group of 2,000. I was sat in a tent with a Yemen family as that was happening, drinking tea with them, and they were scared as well of what was happening outside. But who was telling their story? So in fact, in the middle of the riot, the photograph that appeared all around the world, I took this photograph the same moment, in the same place. And this was the Iraqi kids who wanted to show me their new street dancing skills. So what is truth? Well, both are true but I believe only one of them was really the honest truth of what was happening that day. Um, here's another example of, as photographers, how important it is now that we are all interconnected. I think it's great that people that I photograph on these walls, I'm able to send them images back so that they can see what I'm doing with their stories. I think it's really, really good to be that transparent, that we are all accountable to the people that we document. Um, this was in um, Berlin on Christmas Day, and a young guy, a refugee from uh, Syria, was showing me the photographs he had taken of his journey. And he was showing me the pictures he'd taken on his boat on his way to Lesbos. And then we realized that I'd been on the beach the day that he was arriving. So while I was on the beach photographing his boat coming, he had been on the boat taking pictures of the beach. And I thought, that's great. You know, I said earlier, I don't like this phrase to give people voices. He has a voice. Everybody has a voice, but as photographers, maybe we can help their voice to be heard. A little thing about technology, um, and technology my stupidity, uh, which is a good combination. Um, I spent most of my time, as I showed you earlier, working places like South Sudan, Angola, Congo, places where it's very, very difficult to stay in contact with people. When I started documenting this crisis in Lebanon in 2014, um, I met a family, Aya, the girl I was talking about, um, and after a week there, I said, I really want to stay in contact with you. I really want to follow your story. And they were like, yeah, of course, we'd love to. So uh, they lived in the north of, of Lebanon, and I explained what I will do. I will send an email to my friend Patricia, who lives in Beirut. She will translate the email. She has a friend who's a driver. When he's coming up to Tripoli, he can drop off the note at the shop where you go all the time. Next time you go in the shop, the shopkeeper will give it, and I explained to the shopkeeper, that's all fine, you can get the message. Then if you want to reply, send it to the shop, send a message to Patricia, she'll tell the driver, he'll pick the message up, she'll get it back in, in Lebanon, she'll translate it, and then she'll send it to me. And everyone in the room is kind of nodding, and then somebody puts their hand up and says, we oh, could just add us on Facebook. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, that's the other option, it's a bit obvious if you ask me, but if you want to go that way. But it's a really important thing. We are all interconnected. It's not, no longer, it's not about us and them. It is only us. And that's one of the things I try and get through in my work. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this woman. This is Shamar. You can see her portrait at the end there. Now, I have traveled the world. I have met many, many amazing people. But nobody has scared the shit out of me like Shamar. This woman is terrifying. 
I arrived at this camp in Jordan. It was a very desperate situation, just a few families living there. And as I stepped out the car, she came charging at me, waving her finger. And she said, we don't want a photographer here. Because we need help. We don't want somebody taking our photo. And I couldn't argue with that. Of course she is right. I said, well, just let me visit. And over the next week, I would go back and visit. And I would listen. Listen to the stories I was being told. But I took no photographs. After a week, I was ready to take some portraits. I get my white sheet, we set it up. Some of the young men in the kind of community are helping me make a little studio. I turn around, I'm loading my camera, and when I turn back, Shamar was stood in front of the sheet. Now, I never asked to take her portrait. I never asked to take her photograph. She gave me that. And I always say, the best photographs are not taken, they're given. And all the pictures in this exhibition are gifts. Each one of them is a story that has been lent to me, a story that I look after and then try and share. But for me, that story of Shamar is the great thing about photography. It's always allow time, give space. And when people are ready, then they will come to you for the photograph. Now, I said I'd been commissioned uh, by the UNHCR to document the refugee crisis. They gave me the greatest brief ever given to a photographer. In one sentence, they commissioned me, and they said, Giles, just follow your heart. And that's what I've been doing. But I knew if I was really going to fulfill that brief, I would have to go back to Lebanon and meet some of the families that I'd met there two years before. So last year, that's what I did. I went back to Lebanon, and I went back and found some of these families. People like Abdel, who lived on the rooftop. Now, I think it's really nice to take back photographs and give them to the people that you've documented. But let me tell you, for a guy with no legs and one arm, taking a photographic print halfway around the world is a pain in the ass. So I get there, I give Abdel his photograph, he looks at me, looks at the photograph, and then says, Giles, you've made me look really old in this. <laughs> and I was like, well, there's gratitude for you. Um, Reem uh, was still living on the rooftop, but she now had more of her family with her. And in many ways, life had returned to normal. This is her with her daughter, Sarah. But of course, for refugee families, life never does return to normal. I remember asking Sarah, like you would with many kids, what's your favorite subject at school? Tell me about your friends. And she looked at me and she said, I don't go to school. And for four years, she's been unable to attend school. She has no friends of her age. Like over 60% of all refugees of that age, they have no access to education. Of course, on this trip, I also managed to track down Aya and her family. Um, Aya was exactly the same. This is her being pushed in a wheelchair by her brother, and she's screaming, faster, donkey, faster. But like Reem's family, they're stuck in limbo. The parents are not allowed to work. The children can't go to school, and if Aya is sick, they couldn't take her to hospital. Now, I said that I tried to track down all these families, but obviously I couldn't track down all of them. On the last day I was in Lebanon on this particular trip, I got a phone call. It was from Jamal, the husband of Khalud, the woman who had been paralyzed by a sniper's bullet. And he said, Giles, we hear you're back in Lebanon, we'd love to see you. I said, great, I'll come and see you, where are you? I remember those words so clearly, he just said, we're in the same tent. And I repeated the question, I said, where are you? And he said, we're in the same place, you last saw us. And I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. I felt sick. Because I thought of all the people I'd met two years before, nobody was in more need than Khalud. And I had taken a photograph. I had told her story. And yet nothing had changed. And I remember thinking, what's the point then? What's the point in taking photographs? What's the point in telling stories if it doesn't have an impact? I went to see them the next day. I walked into the tent and I burst into tears. And I looked at Khalud and I said, I failed you. You trusted me with your story and nothing happened. Now, they're an amazing family. They just hugged me and they said, we knew you'd come back. It doesn't matter. But I felt in my heart, I questioned everything that I do. But I thought, you know what? There's only one thing I know how to do. 
and that is to take photographs and tell stories. So I decided what I would do is photograph them again. And so over the coming week, I would document their daily life. Now, like I say, they live in this tiny, tiny room. There's no window. Clue did not left that bed in two years, just staring at the same ceiling. And yet, it's a place full of love and laughter. When uh, Jamal cooks, Khalud always says, oh, it's not quite right, and then winks at me. Jamal always says to me, I don't think she loves me as much as I love her. It's an incredible home. The kids do homework on the beds. Now, I said that I like to take photographs back with me. But on the last day I was with Khalud and Jamal, I had a really difficult decision to make. Because in my bag, I had the photograph I'd taken of them two years before. And sitting there, I realized that the image was exactly the same as what I saw in front of me. That in two years, nothing had changed. And I thought, if I give them this photograph, won't it upset them? Won't it make them think nothing has changed? But I decided I had to. So on the last day, I handed them this photograph. But before I gave it to them, I said, Khalud, when I took this photograph, I did not take a photograph of a refugee. I did not take a photograph of a disabled woman. What I took a photograph of is a couple who are so deeply in love with each other. And this is a photograph of that love. And that's one of the things I've realized over time, is I'm not a war photographer. I am a photographer of love. I document the love between families going through the worst situations you could possibly imagine. But it is the love that I document. Now, I said at the beginning of this that I believe in the power of photography. A few weeks after that visit with Khalud and Jamal, I was in San Francisco, and I was doing a talk like this, and I was talking about their love. And somebody came up to me, and he said, I'm really inspired by their story. Can I share it? I have a community of people that like to try and make a difference to somebody's life. Can we share their story? I said, of course, brilliant. And we did. And people started donating $5, $10. In the space of one week, a quarter of a million dollars were raised for that family. So earlier this year, I was able to go to Lebanon, get them a new home. We managed to put in some beautiful French doors so she can sit in her bedroom and go into the garden for the first time. The kids are back in school and she can watch them play. This is a photograph of that family in their new home. That is the power of photography. And that is the power of a story. Thank you. Stunned silence is good. Um, I'll also be around here as well um, if you want to come and ask me questions. Because I know sometimes at the end of something like that, actually, you almost need a kind of pause. Um, but I will be here. Yep. So, any questions? I'll come with you uh, to you with the microphone so we can catch it all. Do you do anything with your HPS? I mean, HP5, as they call it. As you call it these days. HP5, do you push it? Do you, do you no, I mean, play around with it? No, I mean, some of, the, some of the, the film is pushed just because of the need for extra light, but I don't do anything with it. Um, I remember being in Lesbos last year, and, and you know, a lot of the world's greatest photographers were there, from James Natchway to... I don't know, all, all of them were there. And we used to laugh, because in the evening, they'd all have to find somewhere where there was some decent internet. And I would be like, I've just got to find a post office, and I'll meet you at the bar. <laughs> so all my film just goes in a bag and, and post it. Or you think the, uh, the media doesn't, doesn't want to buy your pictures, doesn't want to show them? Sorry, what, I, what do you think in the media, the newspapers, they don't buy, they don't want to show your pictures? Why, why don't they want to show my pictures? Um, I mean, increasingly they, they, they want more, but I think, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, for example, I did a story on the Rohingya in Kutupalong camp. 
25,000 Rohingya refugees living there in some of the worst situations I'd ever seen. The same people that are on the media nonstop now. But I remember going with that story to all the Sunday papers here, and the thing would be, yeah, but what's the hook? What's the angle? Why are we doing the story now? And that's the strange thing about the media. They always want a hook or an angle, or is it an anniversary, or is it something specific? For me, these stories, you know, one of the things I would say with all these photographs is, as photographers, we have to remember that stories don't end when we leave. And likewise, these stories are going on before we get there. But the media tends to just focus on one story, that's everything that they're concerned about, and then they move on to the next one. My role is to keep reminding people that these stories continue before or after, that it's a continuation of these things, that for these people, you know, like uh, a lot of the families, the pictures over there, that's been done over four years, where I go back and forward. But media would say, well, we've done that story. I've had them, people say that, well, why would you go back to that family? We did that story. So I guess just my role is to, to remind people that things go on over time. You know, next week I leave here to go back to Angola, to go back to some of the places I was in 10 years ago to see what's happened there. So that's just my choice of doing it, but it's just not something that the media particularly likes to do. With all the uh, things that are happening in the world today, is there a story that you want to tell, places that you want to go that you just haven't been, been able to cover? Um, I mean, I've been in 14 countries this year, from northern Iraq to Colombia, Cambodia, South Sudan. I mean, I couldn't go to any more than I'm going to. <laughs> um, you know, unfortunately, there's, there's a lot of stories and a lot of places, um, but I don't think there's anywhere that I think I can't go or, or wouldn't go. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in that I've been doing it for a long time, so a lot of charities and people want to work with me and, and, and telling these stories. Um, but yeah, there's nothing that I think, there's nothing, what should I say, there's nothing that I think that I haven't been able to tell, but there's definitely stories I wish had been given more exposure. Um, how do you prevent becoming desensitized when you're so exposed to all of this all the time? Um, you know, I hope I never become desensitized. If I become, if this doesn't bother me, then I'll stop working. You know, I always say these stories are like scars on my brain. You know, each one of them is a memory. Um, each one is somebody that I've connected with. Many of them I stay in contact with and try and find ways to help and support, but not all of them, of course. And I always say the pictures that really haunt me are the ones that you don't see. Because they're the ones that, for whatever reason, don't make the edit. And I always feel I failed those people let them down. Because inevitably, you know, if you have 15 portraits, maybe I've shot 100 portraits. So it's all the photographs that are not on the wall that are still stuck in my file somewhere that I think I let those people down. So those are the ones that really bother me. Because normally if a photograph is published or something happens, maybe that family gets help. So, I don't know. I mean, I was in Mosul this year with the fighting. I mean, that, that was some of the worst things I've ever seen. And I remember leaving that feeling just in such a dark place. But the simple reality is, this is the small thing that I can do to make a difference. James Natchway, the photographer, the war photographer, somebody said to him, how do you keep going back to these places? And he said, it's hard. But once you've been to these places, it's even harder to turn away. So. Uh, thank you. Can I just ask you about printing? And this is not really a technical question, but it's more to do with how you feel about your images. It, do you print your own work, or if somebody does it for you, how do you work with them to ensure that they communicate through the print what you want to say? Because obviously a printer yeah. can interpret your work very differently to you. No, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I started, Photography, I remember getting my little uh, Jessup's home darkroom kit and, and going in the darkroom. I loved printing. Um, and I still love printing. It's just, unfortunately, it's not practical for me because I'm traveling all the time. I think it's easier now because I have a body of work that people can maybe make reference to and they can see the way it, it, it looks. Um, I'm going to be getting a darkroom again soon, which I can't wait to, uh, to actually be back in, in printing. Because it is, it's, it's, for me, it's the kind of the craft of photography. You know, it's certainly one of the big parts of the craft in photography. And it's amazing to see how different printers can interpret your work. It's a bit like a, a band with their producer. You know, a band can be great, but a producer can take it to another level. So, I mean, with Ilford it was great. I was able to go up and see prints, and they would send me, you know, examples of it. Um, but also, I'm sure, like every photographer in this room, I'm never really happy with my work. I'm never really happy that it's reached exactly as I want it to be. Um, that's nothing to do with the printer. That's just my own 
my own mood. Some days I wake up and think everything's too light or too dark. So I'm always kind of searching. But it's interesting even going back to work I did 10 years ago and reprinting it and doing it in a different way. But I think it's like, uh, as I say, it really is very similar to a producer in a band. That if you want to get the best out of your printing, you have to trust the printer to, to put their, their look into it. So that's really how I see it, is their skill is printing. So I have to trust what they do. Can I ask, um, because of your loss of limbs, um, you're putting yourself on the line and going off to these worn torn countries. Do you think that has any bearing? Um, what, the fact that I don't have the legs when I go to these places? Yeah. means I've got less to lose now. I don't know. <laughs> Um, and I've always said focus is kind of overrated, so I focus one-handed, so it's maybe not always so good. Um, no, it has an impact. I mean, you go to places, and I think, you know, I showed you a picture that earlier on of a young kid in South Sudan who'd been shot, and you always feel, and I still feel like a vulture sometimes, photographing people in their worst moments, but the difference is now, well, two things. One is that I've been photographed myself moments after being injured, so I probably have an insight that no other photographer does. And, and secondly, obviously people see that I've been through a journey similar to them. And so I think there's a certain uh, trust and respect that comes from that, so that people probably talk to me that they wouldn't necessarily talk to others. Um, I mean, one of these portraits here of a close-up of, of a man there was in Zathby camp, and um, he came up to me. I was actually being filmed for something, and he came up, and he said, I know this man, because he'd seen me there visiting before. And he goes, he's the only man I'd let do my portrait. And he'd, been, uh, he'd lost a leg in the fighting in Syria. And so he came over and asked me to do his portrait. So yeah, there's opportunities and things that happen that way. Hi, if you could just say some more about the foundation, because we can see you wearing the t-shirt. So. Yeah, nice. That's not a planted question. Um, <laughs> I decided, you know, often people were asking me, how can I help the people in the photographs? How can I actually do something? And like I was talking about Khalud, we raised quarter of a million. In fact, we, we managed to help six families from that. Um, and so I guess it's just a, a continuation of my work. Um, so now, this week, we officially became a charity so that now I can directly support the people in my photographs. You know, it's very easy to sometimes think, you know, I go to Lebanon, there's 1.5 million refugees, and you help six families. And in a way, you think, well, is, is that the right thing? Is it worth it? But it's the one thing we can do. And like I said earlier, I believe in the power of a story. And, and so if I'm telling somebody's story and they want to help those families, then that's something we can do. But also it comes, you know, we spread it out. But also the other element of that is supporting artists, uh, writers, musicians who live in war zones themselves. So as part of this exhibition, you know, I, I brought over three friends of mine. Um, three friends have all lost their homelands because of war. Um, but they're the artists in residence here. Because I thought if I got given a platform, I should share it with them. So we have uh, Saman, who is a painter, whose work is at the end there, um, Allah, who's a violinist, and Solomon, who's a writer. And it's one of the things we want to do. Like I said earlier, I don't want to create sympathy. You know? I, when I got injured, I didn't want sympathy. And I don't want to create sympathy for the people I photograph. But I want to create solidarity. And part of that is kind of exchanging ideas as artists. Great. One more question, if there is one, maybe? Or you okay with that, Giles? One more? Yeah, of course. Well, there you go. You say one more when no one puts <laughs> the hand up. <laughs> no, it's worth saying, I know Giles has been very modest. He's also got a book of all of his images that is all associated with the UNHCR as well. Um, the book is called I Can Only Tell You What My Eyes See. And that, again, simply came down to that fact of honesty. You know, people criticize the work I do. You know, people, there's a sort of divided, polarized society at the moment. But literally, all I can do is tell you what my eyes see. And that's what this work here is. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, can we put our hands together again for Giles Dooley? <laughs>